Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And uh, we're going to continue to look at this comparison between um, uh, Greece, beginning with Alexander the Great, and uh, our present truth line, starting with the Soviet-Afghan War. Um, and we've had some discussion yesterday, and we're starting to put these things on the line. And there's still much that we don't understand. So before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your word and the opportunity to study it together, to have the fellowship of your spirit as we uh, seek your presence and seek understanding. We know, Lord, that much of this deals with the world's history, uh, but we know, Lord, that it applies to each of us individually, that it is present truth and um, that the understanding of it can increase our faith and trust in you and um, promotes the completion of this work that you have begun upon the earth. So we just invite your spirit to be our teacher as we study these things. We pray for one another. You know the needs that we have. And we know, Lord, that you have purposes that we do not understand fully. So help us to trust in you and be with us now. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning again. And uh, yesterday we, we dealt with this idea about the fact that we have two lines here. Uh, one is 1989. Um, it begins in 1989, where the king of the north defeats the king of the south. Um, and then we're trying to understand uh, uh, this this battle. The king of the south in our history is going to be involved in, well, that's the Soviets, but in this Soviet-Afghan war that we have um, that precedes the time of the end on November 9th, 1989. And so... That, that, that precedes that war, we're going to have a battle where the North defeats, the King of the North defeats the King of the South. Now in 323 BC, um, we have Alexander the Great. Now this is the period of darkness. So that's what we're really trying to understand here. How does this relate to the time of the end? We put the time of the end as the death of Alexander the Great. Now, now Alexander's death, of course, is is just what's going to mark that um, scattering of his kingdom. Now, of course, he conquers Persia. Persia, um, well, in this case, we would look at Alexander the Great being Greece, would represent globalism, the king of the south. And so we had some discussion about it on how to understand the parallels of these histories. And we know that in 1798, the king of the south defeats the king of the north, and in 1989, the king of the north defeats the king of the south. And, and so it's not inconsistent to say that we have a line, because we have a line that begins in 1798, where the king of the south defeats the king of the north, and we have a line in 1989 where the king of the north defeats the king of the south. So, so it's not um, incongruous to have this type of, of design in two parallel lines. Now, of course, we have the death of Alexander, which, I mean, technically he would be the king of the South. He's the king of the globalists of Greece. Um, and it's not particularly a battle there. So the battle is actually preceding that. That's when he's going to conquer Persia. And, and that's going to happen in 331. Um, our, our chart has it as 330. Uh, 1843 chart. So I'm not, I'm not really sure how to, to understand that history, how they're looking at it. I'd have to look more at the pioneers writings. And, um, so, so saying that the death of Alexander is the arrival of the first message, uh, there, there's some reasoning behind it. And November 9th, 1989, I mean, this, this defeat of the king of the south by the king of the north, it happens you know, gradually it starts November 9th, 1989 in some ways. That's the, the date we mark. But it also has a December 25th, 1991 date. 
which we would have, I believe, as the formalization of that. So we have to under, try to understand how we can put this together, how we can uh, parallel these two. And so while we're looking at uh, the historic application, we're also trying to see how it affects the present truth applica application at the same time. Okay, I don't know if anybody had time to, to look at this history. I did not, unfortunately. But, um, um, and, and if we try to look up this, you know, if you try to look up Daniel chapter uh, 11 and you go online and you want to find out about this history, they're always going to put a Tychus Epiphanes in there, right? Uh, which we don't have. Right. And they're going to put a Tychus Epiphanes. It's it's a later interpretation of that. So I don't know. You know, it would be nice if somebody just gave us, you know, we had a nice list. And I've been trying to find like a nice list of all of these battles. So. So which battles are you talking about? All the battles between the Seleucid and uh uh, the Ptolemaic empires. Okay. So, you know, I, I just, you know, now they call these, uh, the Syrian wars. There's a series of six wars between the Seleucid empire and the Ptolemaic kingdom. Uh, okay. So if you go to Wikipedia, I guess we can go there. So we just take a quick glance here at Wikipedia. These are the Syrian wars, right? It says there's, um, Six wars between the Seleucid Empire and the Ptolemaic Kingdom of Egypt. Successor states to Alexander the Great's Empire during the third and second centuries BC over the region they called Col Syria, which is hollow Syria, one of the few avenues into Egypt. These conflicts drained the material manpower of both parties and led to the eventual destruction and conquest by Rome and Parthia. These are briefly mentioned in the biblical book of Maccabees. And they don't mention that it's in Daniel's prophecies, but <clears throat> okay. Um, now they have, so there's the Diadochi, Diadochi, Diadochi. I'm not sure how you pronounce that. Wars. What's that? The Diadochi. Diadochi. Okay. Yeah, they have it here. Di, Diadochi. 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 No, they have it as diadochi, is what they say. Right? See there, the diadochi. Okay. <clears throat> anyway, doesn't really matter. <laughs> uh, they say there's uh, Koine Greek diadochi. Anyway. Um, so these are the successors, right? They're going to have these wars, and they fought control over his empire after his death in 323 BC. So originally you have Ptolemy, Antigus, Antig Antigonus, Cassander, and Seleucus as the last remaining at the end of the wars of the successors. So when the Bible talks about these four, I've sometimes seen criticisms, well, there was more than four. Well, there was more than four, but... At the end of this period, there's going to be four. Now, so we have those wars. Uh, so it says that uh, Hall of Syria came under the rule of Antigonus, the first monothalamus. And in 301, Ptolemy the first Soda, who four years earlier had crowned himself king of Egypt, exploited events surrounding the Battle of Ipsus to take control of the region. Victors at Ipsus, however, had allocated Hollow Syria to Ptolemy's former ally, Seleucus I Nicator, founder of the Seleucid Empire. Seleucus, who had been aided by Ptolemy during his ascent to power, did not take any military action to reclaim the region. Once both were dead, however, their successors became embroiled in war. So, so they have these first wars, the Diadochi Wars, the Attiki, Okay, and then um, a decade into his rule, Ptolemy II faced Antiochus I, 
the Seleucid king who was trying to expand his empire's holdings in Syria and Anatolia, right? So this is the first Syrian war. Right? And um, Ptolemy so it talks about these 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 wars, um, and and these wars are mentioned some in more detail than others, right? Uh, we know about this part here. Um, I'll just read this. The first Syrian war was a major victory for the Ptolemies, and Tychus took the Ptolemaic controlled areas in coastal Syria and southern Anatolia in his initial rush. rush. Ptolemy conquered these territories by 271b, extending Ptolemaic rule as far as Korea and into most of Cilicia. But Ptolemy's eyes focused eastward, his half brother Magus declared his province of Cyrenica to be independent. It would remain independent until 250 BC when it was reabsorbed by, into the Ptolemic kingdom, but not before having triggered a sequence of Ptolemic and Seleucid court intrigues, war, and ultimately leading to the marriage of Theos and Berenice. That's, um, that's, is that Ptolemy Theos, I think, right? I always get it mixed up. Um, <clears throat> so they're going to say Antiochus, the second Theos. Okay, so that the Bernice then is uh, uh, Egyptian. Okay. So then they're going to have the second Syrian war. That's going to be 260 to 253 BC. Um, and then they're going to have the third Syrian war, 246 to 241. The fourth Syrian war. 219 to 217. So that's going to end with the Battle of Raphia, right? And then you're going to have the Fifth Syrian War, 202 to 195, and, and they're connecting that to the Battle of Paneum. And then you're going to have the Sixth Syrian War, um, and it's going to be this war, which um, we, we studied into. So there's the background. Um, so there's Rome is involved here, right? So this is going to be when Rome comes into play, right? It's going to exalt itself to establish the vision in this history. Okay. So those are the, the, the Syrian wars. Would we, would we just take each of these wars and make them a way mark? What would we do with these wars? Or do we look more closely, um, at what the scriptures are saying as far as uh, how we lay these out in these way marks. I mean, we know that Rome's going to come in and, and, and I would put Rome at the seventh way mark. So I'm not sure how we would, would set this up. A any ideas? So we have different ways of doing this. We have, we can just say the death of Alexander is the time of the end. Right. And that's when the kingdom is divided. And then you would have the six Syrian wars be each of these different way marks. And that would and then we would look at how we applied the events in those wars with our line. And from what I can see, it would it actually fit fairly well, at least some of the things that I'm I'm certain about. We'd have to figure out which, which war and why. Um, why would it be uh, the second angel arriving? We'd have to look at that. <clears throat> so, I mean, we could just start writing these wars in here. We could look at the scriptures themselves that then apply to those different um, wars. So we could say that uh, the di diac di Adaki wars would be this increase of knowledge that's going to end up establishing that we finally have uh, Seleucid and Ptolemy fighting over and we would have then the first Syrian war as the formalization of a message. <clears throat> what, what do people think about that idea? So I'm saying we put the Diadochi wars in here, Diadochi. So we have the death of Alexander, marking the time of the end. 
What would be the increase of knowledge? Diadochi Wars. <laughs> so that would establish that we have then the Seleucid and the Ptolemaic empires that are then going to go to war in the Syrian wars. So we just have each one of these waymarks. This a suggestion that we have each one of these next waymarks as the six Syrian wars, which would make the third Syrian war the arrival of the second angel's message. And we'd have to figure out why that would be. But in our lines, we have the um, increase of knowledge as being like, you know, the increase of Bible knowledge. Yeah, but this is not about the Bible knowledge, right? So remember, this is this is the history. So the period of darkness here, that's what we would have to look at. So what is the period of darkness? The period of darkness is um, this period in which Alexander builds up his kingdom, right? Right. With his death, that marks the end of that period of darkness. And now we have uh, the division of his kingdom which the Bible addresses and the increase of that knowledge is just related to the Greek kingdom in Bible prophecy. So remember, this is not a gospel message that's being illustrated. It's just a parallel to the gospel message, right? So it, it's, it's a repeat of history. It's a history. We don't, we don't have the gospel being proclaimed in, in this history. Yeah, I understand that. I just, you know, but you're still going by the pattern of what I was doing. Right. So the increase of knowledge would have to do with the line itself. So if we have the di- diadochi wars, and then you're going to have uh, the division of Greece into the north and south, obviously the first Syrian war would be the formalization of that message, right? So now we we often say that, you know, a line is a three step testing prophetic message. Now, in some ways, a Greece is being tested here. But but not necessarily in the gospel sense. Because because Greece, are they going to become. The kingdom that, you know, crucifies Christ. Right. We know Rome has to exalt itself to establish the vision. And that, and that really is going to address all of these visions connected with the 70 weeks because Rome is going to be the one that's going to crucify Christ. And that's why we, we took Rome exalting itself to establish the vision is not that Rome is doing that, right? I mean, it's establishing the vision, but that's in God's providence because Rome has no idea that it's establishing a vision or anything of biblical prophecy. So, so Greece is illustrating this, uh, this history that parallels a line. And we use these symbols, the Battle of Raphia and Paneum, et cetera, to, um, to address this. Now, another way that we could do this line is, um, we could, um, you know, we could start with the first message is the first Syrian war. And then, you know, something after the first Syrian war then would be the seventh, right? The third angel arriving. <clears throat> okay, so that. Wouldn't it, wouldn't the increase of knowledge be like, um, Greek education? The, you know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I know what you're saying. I'm thinking about it. Oh, okay. But I, I don't see how Greek education is being promoted here in this time more than any other time. I mean, that would be, um, I mean, Greek education as far as it's, I mean, that's a much earlier history. If you're going to go into the history of Greek and Greek philosophy and so forth. I mean, obviously, it's going to continue all through this, but it starts before this. I mean, um, we have. Uh, it was just a thought, Theodore. I didn't. I just, yeah, cause, cause you got Aristotle. He's in 384 B.C. Yeah, and it's a thought. You don't need to apologize. We throw things out and we look at them and then, right? So, I mean, so that's Aristotle. And then you have, um, I mean, you're going to have uh, even Plato. He's going to be um, 
in 370. So he's still going to be before this. I mean, he'll be alive during this time. Yeah. So he, you know, he dies in, oh, pardon me. He, he dies. No, he's actually born in 428 and dies in 423. And so I'm looking at this wrong. And then with Aristotle, um, because I thought he was, so Aristotle is going to be 384. So Plato is, is going to be earlier. Right. So you got Plato's earlier and then Aristotle. Okay. So, so that's all before. Um, now one of the things I like about this is if we were to look at how this um, Wikipedia article looks at these wars, uh, they're going to have the Battle of Raphia under uh, the Fourth Syrian War. That's going to be the fifth way mark, right? And then you're going to have the Battle of Paneum under the Fifth Syrian War. That would be the sixth way mark. And we already place Raphia and Paneum there, right? So, I mean, I'm just inclined to put these wars um, at least there and then things that happen within the history of those wars uh, actually marking the way marks themselves. So um, maybe I'd do it like this, just as, so these are, okay, what do people think of this? Does this make any sense? Because you're going to then have, you know, Raphia here. And copy this. Right, so over here we're going to have Raphia, and then here we're going to have Neon. So these are the particular battles that we mark as midnight and the midnight cry. Okay. Any thoughts on this? And I don't know what we would mark here, you know, as far as the details of the first Syrian war as the formalization of the message, whether it's just the first Syrian war itself. Would you be looking at this first war basically from about, let's say, 274 to 271 B.C.? Yeah, that's what they're saying, 274 to 271. So is the main issue on this the control of southern Syria? Yeah, because it's going to be the the control of of what they call hollow Syria, you know, primarily. Now, this is the one where you're going to have this this um, marriage of uh, uh, Antigus the second Theos and Berenice, this uh, Egyptian princess or whatever you want to call it. Now, as far as the formalization of the message, I mean, there's one thing interesting. It has 271 BC. We know the Battle of Raphia is 217, and both are formalizations of a message. Um, so when we get to the Third Syrian War, uh, this would have to be something that we could mark as the second angel arriving. So do we do we also, if, if this is the formalization, do we also then point to the arrival and the empowerment? Yeah, so the arrival is the death of Alexander. The Diadochi Wars are this sorting out till we get to a king of the north and the king of the south who are then going to begin the six Syrian wars. Right? So the formalization is the king of the north and the king of the south having these battles. In this case, the king of the south is going to be victorious in gaining this territory. Right. And of course, we can see how this relates to the Jews in the sense that, um, you know, part of that territory is going to be the area of, of Palestine in Jerusalem and, and all of that, that they're, that they're, that is connected with these battles. Okay. So, the major combatants in this would be the Seleucid Empire and Egypt, right? Yeah. 
Is there a minor combatant with this? Or tertiary? Uh, well, there's definitely tertiary. You know, there's different nations that get involved here at different times. I mean, the main thing is we're going to see that that Rome is going to exalt itself to establish the vision in this sixth Syrian war. Um, that's where we put it. It's history. It's it's connected dealing with that history after the Battle of Paneum. Um, I mean, it's kind of there in the Battle of Paneum, sort of behind the scenes, but it's it's really active in the sixth Syrian war, right? And and this is all about this line is is bringing us up just to the end of Greece, when Greece basically, you know, now Rome is going to come into uh, this history. Now, so there's there's still lots that we have to look into, but when you get to the Sixth Syrian War, that's going to bring us up to, um, like the Battle of Pydna, and and things like that. And so, I mean, one thing is we could put Pydna as the seventh way mark, you know, and then you're going to have um, what ends up happening after that, which sometimes are too, uh, termed uh, the Seleucid dynastic wars, sometimes being the seventh Syrian war, right? So this is going to be more dealing with, I mean, in that history, we're really dealing with Rome rising, right? Which is right after this third angel arrives. So, but I do think it, it fits in really well. The, the one that I have is just um, how do we look at um, the third Syrian war as being the second angel arriving? Now, in this here, they have the Battle of Andros in 246 BC as one of the main battles there. But it's going to be, you know, 246 to 241. So it's going to be, it's also. It's also known as the Laodicean War, the Third Syrian War. And that's just because uh, of dealing with Laodice and uh, Berenice, right? So we know that we studied this from the Bible's point of view, right? So so we'd have to figure out why that's the second angel arriving. What, what does that mean? And so we'd have to look more into this history of these wars to understand the details and how they uh, parallel these histories. But I, I think the initial idea is fairly sound. <clears throat> right. Um, that we could put the wars this way rather than starting the first war with the first angel arriving. We put the death of Alexander as the first angel arriving and the division of his kingdom. And, and this parallel is what we've already understood about uh, the parallel to our history. So we've already put the death of Alexander as November 9th, 1989. So, so when we look at the scriptures here and we start uh, marking out, well, here, well, let's do it this way. Because we, we've already done uh, a lot here. So we have... Um, all of this Soviet-Afghan war, this is the spirit of darkness. And then when she, he shall stand up at the height of his power, November 9th, 1989, his kingdom shall be broken. So we mark that as the time of the end. It's November 9th, 1989. It's going to be 323 BC. Um, and now we mark, um, well, the way that we put this, the height of his power is November 9th, 1989. And his kingdom is broken in uh, December 25th, 1991. So so we just put that all as one history. That That's what we mark as the time of the end. So uh, I don't know how we can connect that symbol with this line. So once you have the Soviet Union... Um, uh, fall, right? There's this period of time in which it falls. So, so in some ways, you know, we're, we're putting, you know, this history of the Soviet Afghan war up to February 15th, 1989. And then we have this period in which, uh, they fall. So, 
um, probably what we would do with these lines is we would, you know, we would put this here. Um, I guess I'll better do it this way. So that's that period of 777 inclusive days. So that's one way to do it. We could put even the formalization of the message is December 25th, 1991. That's another way to do it. And then we'd have to line that up with the first Syrian war. So, so either this or that. Um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this. So, well, I don't know which is right at this point, but I think the way that I looked at this before, at least the way I was thinking of it was that it parallels like this. And so this period of 777 days would mark this parallel to the, the Diadochi Wars. So that becomes the increase of knowledge in this line. Now, so when we're looking at this line, when we're looking at our present truth line, it, it's not the same as our other lines that we have had necessarily with uh, November 9th, 1989 is the time of the end. Because we would have to look at what's happening with the Soviet-Afghan war, what it symbolizes, and um, how this history bears out. So one of the things we're looking at is this has to do with the UN, right? So the UN is involved in this. Um, with the end of the Soviet Union, you're going to have the transition uh, to the UN. And one of the things uh, that ends up happening with uh, this history. So you've got, um, so um, we have Mikhail Gorbachev and um, so his retirement and marks the end of the Soviet Union. So there's going to be lots of things uh, involved here. And I'm looking at some old articles here. Anyway, we look at that that's where the transition happens. The trans transition from the Soviet Union being the globalist, the atheistic power. We're just saying, um, with the death, with the end of the Soviet Union, obviously it can't be that power anymore and that that's going to be transferred to the UN. Okay. Just like, you know, France, the King of the South, it was transferred to the Soviet Union. So we have it from France to the Soviet, to the Soviet Union, then to the UN. So it takes over that role, right? So it's, it's divided towards the four winds of heaven. This is globalism. So it's not going to be under one ruler is, uh, and so that's the UN. His kingdom shall be plucked up even for others besides those. Right, so I'm just saying that this is going to be the UN. And the king of the south, uh, Ptolemy the first, so the UN and the globalist shall be strong, and one of his princes, Seleucus the first, Nicator, and he, Seleucus the first, USA, shall be strong above him, and have dominion, gain the tor territory of Syria, that's Aram in Hebrew, the global economy, his dominion shall be great. Dominion, largest territory of the Hellenistic empires, controls the trade routes. And in the end of years, after the first and second Syrian wars. And so we put 9-11 as the empowerment of the first angel, right? So, and that's what I would put. They, Ptolemy II, the Philadelphus, and Antiochus the first Soter shall join themselves together, conclude, conclude peace in 252. 9-11 is the, the arrival of the second angel. So we've done some of this work already. So the way that we have understood this is this is going to be uh, 252 BC, and that's going to be marked at the second angel arrival. Right? In our history, this is going to be 9-11. But... Um, and when, then we have this empowerment. Are people following this? Is this making sense at all? So 9-11 is both the empowerment of the first angel 
and uh, the arrival of the second. So the second Syrian war also marks 9-11. And the events in the second Syrian war, so there's some interesting things in here as I'm looking. So there's this, um, well, I'm going to read it here. So let's go through and read what Wikipedia says about these wars. Okay, so so the first Syrian war is just this control over this area. Second Syrian war, and Tychus II succeeded his father in 261 and began a new war for Syria. He reached an agreement with the current Antigonid king in Macedonia, uh, Antiochus II Gonatus, who also had interested, was also interested in pushing Ptolemy II out of the Aegean, that's the Aegean Sea. With Macedon's support, Antiochus II launched an attack on Ptolemic outposts in Asia. Most of the information about the Second Syrian War has been lost. It is clear that Antigonus fleets, Antigonus's fleet defeated Ptolemies at the Battle of Kos in 261, Diminishing Ptolemic naval power, Ptolemy appears to have lost ground in Cilicia, Pamphylia, and Ionia, while Antiochus regained Miletus and Ephesus. Macedon's involvement in the war ceased when Antigonus became preoccupied with the rebellion of Corinth and Chalcis in 253, possibly instigated by Ptolemy as well as an increase in enemy activity along Macedon's northern frontier. The war was concluded around 253 BC um, with the marriage of Antiochus to Ptolemy's daughter Berenice. Berenice. Antiochus repudiated his previous wife, Laodice, and turned over substantial domain to her. He died in Ephesus in 246 BC, poisoned by Laodice, according to some sources. Now here in this one, it's not going to mention 252, but we have 252 in our previous studies. So, so we have 252 here. That's the second Syrian war. Um, okay, so the third Syrian war is going to be 246. So maybe I've got this backwards, trying to understand this here. Okay. Yeah, so that's dealing with the second Syrian war, that would be 252. I have that as the arrival of the second angel. Any thoughts about this? I don't know how how people want to look at this. So we have the third Syrian war is marked as 246 BC. And that should be uh, our second angel arrives. But we had done in our study, we had put 252 BC as the second angel arriving. So we didn't quite line up the, the six Syrian wars exactly like that. Right? So we had 252 when they conclude peace. And um, so that's really part of the second Syrian war. So we don't really have the third Syrian war listed here in our study. Is this too complicated for people to think about? No, it's just when we're placing this more on a line, it, it reinforces what we have been addressing. Yes. Yeah. And and I think, you know, we don't necessarily have to have each one of those waymarks as these Syrian wars, as understood by Wikipedia, right? Because the Bible isn't necessarily saying the first Syrian war is this waymark and the second Syrian war is this waymark and the third. It's the events here that are significant, significant along with the symbols that we would then attach to this. So, so the first and second Syrian war are going to be involved in this history. The, the history of the empowerment of the first angel and the arrival of the second. All right. So, so we have um, <clears throat> um, the empowerment of the first angel because we have the formalization as being when they start these wars. And um, we had this dealing with uh, the first and second Syrian war. Um, and uh, Berenice is going to be 
uh, married to the king of the north, Antiochus II. They make an agreement of peace through marriage alliance. So hmm, I'm just reading over this a bit more. So we have two aspects. We have two way marks that we would look at as 9-11, right? The empowerment of the first angel and the arrival of the second. And we're saying that um, when they can com- conclude peace in 252 BC, that that's the arrival of the second angel message. But 9-11 as the empowerment of the first angel has to do with um, the first and second Syrian wars. So after those wars, they're going to have this peace agreement. But the first and second Syrian wars would be the empowerment of the first angel. Now we had this phrase, and in the end of years, right, <clears throat> um, that we had looked at. I don't see my footnotes on it. We didn't, uh, why we didn't do anything with that as far as how do we understand that end of years? And in the end of years, that is after the first and second Syrian wars. Um, so the first and second Syrian wars are this period that we would call the years. It's going to end at 9-11. That's going to be the conclusion of that. So we have this thing that we call the years. So how, how are we going to address that? And, and this isn't going to be the same as the line down here because that's a different line. So we're going to say that, you know, the formalization of the message is the beginning of this, these wars. So I guess the way that we would do that, let's go back to the diagram. Okay. So what we would have here, so this is going to be dealing with the first Syrian war. Okay. So we have the first Syrian war. And then we're going to have the second Syrian war. And it's going to be this conclusion. Here, that this is the conclusion. This is the Treaty of Peace in 252 BC. So that's going to be the second angel arriving. So that's one way we could look at it. Now, that means the third Syrian war isn't really one of the way marks here. Now, um, in their list of the third Syrian war, I mean, they're going to have the Battle of Andrus. And as far as the scriptures are concerned, let me see here. Um, You know, the question is, does it even comment on the Third Syrian War? Okay, so if we're going to find this here. Okay, so if we look at these, this list that we have here. So these are the different, um, I've just got to share the screen here the different um, kings of, so we have this peace treaty here in 252. And we're going to have this history um, where you're going to have the third Syrian war. So this is this. So that's where you're going to have, just trying to remember what they do with this history in Daniel and Revelation by Smith. So we have 187 BC and 187 BC. That's going to be quite a bit later in the sixth Syrian war. So if that's the case, so it's going to be the sixth. Just trying to remember where the third Syrian war. So it's going to start here at 246 with Ptolemy the third. So it's basically 246 to 241. So does the Bible address that war when we look at that? I don't think it really addresses it in any kind of detail. I'm just, okay. So, you know, for instance, in Daniel 11, verse 13, and when he hath taken away, oh, pardon me, for the king of the south, for the king of the north shall return, so he'll set forth a multitude greater than the former and shall certainly come after certain years with great army and much riches, right? So this, um, 
So you, and and Daniel eleven eleven. So we're going to be dealing here with the battle of Raphia and the battle of Neum. So if you're going to have the third Syrian war in there, it probably have to be verse ten, because verse seven to nine deals all of that dealing with Berenice and Laodicea. So Seleucus Callinicus and Seleucus Serenius and Antiochus Magnus. So that's going to be verse 10. If we're going to, so this would cover 246 to 241. So that's going to be the third Syrian war. This here then is going to be in verse 10 is going to be the fourth Syrian war. Does that make sense? Have I got that right? Well, if we place this on the line using this from Scripture, I think it's going to become a little bit more evident. Yeah, because I I don't think the Third Syrian War is actually mentioned in Scripture. It's going to just be kind of passed over and they're going to move uh, right away to... um, the, the fourth Syrian war. So it's the end of the second Syrian war that's going to be marked. And then, uh, then the battle of Raphia is going to be the fourth Syrian war. And that's going to just lead into that. But I just want to see what Swearingen says about this. Um, now, on this, from what we've talked about in the past with the battle of Raphia, that's where Egypt defeats Greece. Right? Yeah, the king of the south defeats the king of the north. And then Paneum becomes where Greece defeats Egypt. Yeah. So there's there, there's some questions in my mind that we will get into as we go further into this particular chapter in Daniel 11. So I think it's important that we note Raphia and Paneum as who the combatants were, who won and who lost. Um, Yeah, okay. Because then it's going to be, you know, yes, we're looking at this situation with our current line, but what if we also need to look at this same type of structure dealing with Rome? Okay, so you're saying when we do the line of Rome. Correct. Yeah, okay. But I think that's kind of what we were th- we were doing, though there's some differences. Yes. Um, so um, when it comes to the Third Syrian War, according to Swearingen, he's going to take, uh, going back to verse um, uh, 7, uh, you know, it's going to be dealing with the third Syrian war when they shall prevail. Right. So he's going to put the third Syrian in war in here where um, this is going to be not the third Syrian war, according to Uriah Smith, from what I can gather. Because um, he takes verse seven to nine, Daniel 11, verse seven to nine. Um, this is going to be in connection with uh the first and second Syrian war. Though, um, so, um, so obviously it's going to lead into events that are connected with the third Syrian war, but, um, because the third Syrian war is known as the Laodicean war. All I'm saying is that I would look at this, um, what they call the third Syrian war as actually just really part of the second Syrian war. Um, it's sort of the, just the revenge over, uh, you know, Berenice and Laodice, Laodice, right? So, so I don't know how to address that because it's, I mean, it's obviously an important detail, uh, but it's going to be the aftermath of what happens in, in the second Syrian war. So I, I don't know. I don't know. Wish I knew. <laughs> But anyway, we got this general line here. So this is kind of how we did it in in our notes. 
This is how we we were looking at this history, whether this is correct or not. So so in in our history, when we put these lines together, we um, so we ended up making this nine eleven and this nine eleven. Right, so we have the two 9-11s there as part of this, um, the end of the second Syrian war and then this peace treaty. So we, we put them together. They parallel things in our history. Now, we don't have um, here yet. You know, we got Rafi and Paneum and how we decided to address Rafi and Paneum was um, um, there's two different ways we did it. So <clears throat> I'm just going to see what we have here. So when we looked at Daniel 11, verse 7 to 9, um, so one of the things is we continue to have these sort of repeats and enlarges, right? That is, we have this whole line, and within these lines, we have other zooms into waymarks. So you can see when we get to the end of verse 6, I mean, it brings us all the way up to November 9th to December 25th, um, dealing with the history of Biden, right? So that's going to be in our line, our 700 and uh, 77 days. Now, of course, this is 17 years and 46 days. And so we, we put this in with this line here. Um so in this line here, this is going to bring us all the way here to, you know, to our history. And then we go back verses seven to nine and we say, well, this is, oh, you can't see what I'm looking at here. <clears throat> so then we go back and, um, you know, look at this and this is going to deal with, um, you know, it's going to go all the way up to uh, January 20th, 2021. And then, right, so we know that that's Biden becoming the president. And then um, and then we're going to look at verse 10. It's going to be this battle between, uh, and, and we're not sure about all of this, but it looks like it goes up to the Sunday law in some way as a symbol and then 11 to 13 well now we're going to be looking at the battle of Rafi and the battle of Paneum right in this history and then it's going to talk more about the battle of Paneum in um, the following verses right so uh, so there's a lot of information and so we you know, so it's it's not it's not that simple. We have to try to understand what Rafi and Paneum are in our history based on what we see here. And um, so when we draw this line, I'm going to have to give it a lot more thought <clears throat> than what I have. But when we draw this line, I mean, this is going to be this history of, that's going on within this movement at the present time. That is. If we take in these six Syrian wars and we get up to the third angel arriving, in our history, it's going to come up to a symbol of the Sunday law. And and here it's going to come up to this point where Rome exalts itself to establish the vision. It's going to be in this history that Rome comes into play. And then when we go back and we look at Rome, we're going to go back over some of these same verses. Um. Because Rome, at the end of Greece, you have the beginning of Rome. So so there's a lot we have to think about, and I don't know how to sort it out right now. I'm going to have to spend some time reading and thinking about it. But so when we're going to say we've got Raphi and Paneum, and we didn't really put the verses in here yet, which we're going to have to. So probably we would have... Um, my mind is not working. You know, so we're going to have to have these verses dealing with, like, for instance, verses seven to nine. Um, 
the king of the shelf shall, shall come into his kingdom. This is going to be, yeah. So it's just going to be dealing with, um, you know, verses seven to nine. Um, and, and then once you get to verse 10, this is going to be addressing, uh, the battle of Raphia. And that's going to go, um, verse 10 and 11, I guess. It's the preparatory stuff to Raphia. Then verse 12, you know, because once you get to verse 16, you have actually Rome, right? So Rome is going to be in verse uh, 16. So, but Rome is there also because the robbers of the people shall come to establish, exalt themselves to establish the vision. Um, so, so it's going to be like verse 14 and 15 are going to be. Uh, the third angel arriving in that history. So that's going to be sort of at the time at the end, at the end of Paneum. <clears throat> okay. So I don't know how to proceed at this point. Like, I mean, I could keep trying to draw some things in here. Um, because if we're going to deal with what Raphia is and what Paneum is, well, this is definitely these two battles. The king of the south defeating the king of the north. In our history, that's the Democrats over the Republicans. And, and then we have the Republicans over the Democrats, which is still future. And then we have the Sunday law. So in our history, I mean, <clears throat> if you wanted to look at this formalization, where would we, what would we mark? Let's go back here. Right, so we kind of went up to verse 16 to end end all of this, right? Pagan Rome comes against him and does according to his own will. That's verse 16. So that's going to be like 14, 15, 16, where Rome exalts itself to establish the vision and then takes over, unless you have a fourth angel arriving from verse 16, which I think is possible. Um, and then that becomes a repeat of history. Rome becomes this repeat of history. Probably that's how I would do verse 16. So um, 14 and 15 is going to be. Now, when they deal with this here, you're going to have the fifth Syrian war. <clears throat> um, so it says in those times. So we looked at that expression in those times. So we took 6256 plus 1992. And we get from 911 to April 10. 10th, 2024. And then the 6256, October 28th, 2018. Jeff's summary of 391.5 and the connection to November 9th, 2019. So, so we had a lot of different things that connected with these symbols, with these numbers that show, um, that they're, that this is marking our history. So in some ways, um, we know that we can take 9-11 and it can have a, a separate purpose. So 9-11 here can also refer to November 9th, 2019. But there's a lot of history in here that we have to decide how that's going to fit into this line. And um, so we're going to use some of the symbols. But we're going to try to be consistent. And I don't, my, right now my brain's not working. I can't, uh, I just know that it's going to be this history. Raffia is going to, to end ultimately with the defeat of the king of the north by the king of the south. The de Democrats defeat the Republicans. And I know we have the numbers and the symbols here that we can place that. So January 20th. Uh, 2021. And then Paneum is some future event in our life. Now, there's different symbols and we can put dates in the future, but, but those dates aren't going to mean anything. That is, you know, we can't predict the future. So, so the dates that we generally give in are symbolic. And when we get to 
uh, the third angel arriving, often we lead to April 5th, 2030 as a symbol. And that becomes uh, the Sunday law, right? So we have Raphia, Paneum, and then the event that we have here, either this is verse uh, 16 itself, which isn't the sixth Syrian war as such. So let me think here. It's the fourth Syrian war, fifth. All right, so this, this is going to deal all of that history with um, dealing with Antiochus Epiphanes. Yeah, Antiochus the fourth Epiphanes. So it's going to bring us into this history of 168. Okay, I'm just going to go here. We'll close off by reading about the Sixth Syrian War. Okay, so the Sixth Syrian War is 178 to 168 BC. Now, the background is going to go back to 195 to 170 BC. So remember, Rome is going to defeat uh, Greece in 191 BC, right? The Seleucids had little desire to entangle themselves in a new war with the Ptolemies. After losing the Roman Seleucid War, they were forced to pay a huge indemnity to the Roman Republic imposed on them at the Treaty of Apamea in 188 BC. So they're going to say this, they have the war from 192 to 188 BC. So that's where Rome is going to have this battle. And the battle was, what was the name of the battle that they won in 191? Dwight, do you remember the name? Thermopylae. Thermopylae, yes. Okay. So there's going to be this Battle of Thermopylae in 191, and that's going to be this way mark. It's the center of the 62 weeks. Okay. Internal dissent and rebellions um, weakened the Ptolemies over time. In particular, the power of the monarchy waned, and the influence of aristocrats of high standing in Alexandria grew as did the power of the Egyptian nativist movements. Ptolemy V seemed to possibly be intending to raise funds to finance an attempt to reclaim Colossirium, but died unexpectedly in 180 BC. In the paranoid atmosphere of the era, many assumed he had been poisoned, perhaps by courtiers, who wished to keep the peace and avoid taxes or levies to finance a war, or because they preferred a young king and regent who would be easier to manipulate. Cleopatra, the regent, favored the peace faction at court, whether because she agreed a war made no sense or because of lingering loyalties to the Seleucid royal family she descended from. Cleopatra I died in 176 BC, but her eldest son, Ptolemy VI Philometer, uh, was still only 10 years old, necessitating a continued regency. Julius and Lanius, a eunuch and slave, became the two regents of the young king of Egypt, likely as a compromise between the relevant Egyptian factions, who could not bear to see a rival on the throne who might have the backing and lineage it claimed uh, to claim it themselves. Under the regents, the young Ptolemy VI was married to his sister Cleopatra II, and she was declared co-ruler. So we get to the Sixth Syrian War. The causes of the new conflict are obscure. Relations declined between the two powers, with both sending emissaries to Rome, uh, then bogged down in the Third Macedonian War, asking for, a mili for military support against the other before the war even started. In 170 BC, Ptolemy's younger sibling, Ptolemy VII, or the eighth, pardon me, uh, Physcon, was declared a co-ruler as well in order to bolster the unity of Egypt. The three siblings range from 10 to 16 years of age. While the causes are still not entirely clear, Ptolemic regents Ulius and Linnaeus seem to have instigated the formal declaration of war on the Seleucid ruler Antiochus IV Epiphanes. This was possibly out of a desire to find a unifying issue to rally the state around, possibly due to political gains in the pro-war faction and likely influenced by a vast misunderstanding of how easy it would be to win such a war. Antiochus IV had gotten word of Egyptian preparations for war and was entire in July and August in 170 BC, preparing his forces, and reached the important strategic town of Pelusium on November 
uh, 170 BC. Just as the Ptolemaic, Ptolemaic army moved out of Pelusium to begin its invasion of, of hollow Syria, the Seleucids defeated the Ptolemaic army in the Sinai Desert, perhaps due to Egyptian surprise at the Seleucids being ready to fight immediately. Ptolemaic uh, losses mounted as they retreated to Pelusium. The Pelusium quickly fell with loss, little loss of life and surrender of the Ptolemaic army. Um, Pelusium was the gateway to the rest of Egypt. With it under control, Seleucid supply lines were secure and Egypt was in grave danger. Antiochus took Nocratus and camped near Alexandria, potentially threatening a siege. Okay, so there's lots here dealing with this Six Syrian War. I don't see anything particular interest yet, um, other than you know we have Rome involved a little bit that they. But so we do have this. So this part here. This is important. Okay. In Antiochus's absence, Ptolemy VI and his brother Ptolemy Physcon were reconciled, possibly after a brief civil structure. Antiochus, angered at his loss of control over the king, invaded again in 168 BC. The Egyptians sent to Rome asking for help, and the Senate dispatched Gaius Pompilius Linius of Alexandria. So we've read about this before. Meanwhile, a Seleucid fleet seized Cyprus, and Antiochus's army took Memphis again. Well, at Memphis, he even issued an official decree as Egyptian king. The Ptolemaic armies failed to offer any major field battles, instead staying fortified in garrisons. Antiochus was now prepared uh, to march on the capital of Alexandria again. At Eleusius, on the outskirts of Alexandria, he met Pompilius Lanius, with whom he had been friends during this, his stay in Rome. But instead of a friendly welcome, Pompilius offered the king an ultimatum from the Roman Senate. He must evacuate Egypt and Cyprus immediately. Rome had only just recently defeated the Macedonians at the Battle of Pydna, potentially freeing up armies with which it could credibly strengthen the Seleucids. Antiochus begged to have time to consider, but Pompilius drew a circle around him in the sand with his cane and told him to decide before he stepped outside of it um, or outside it. Antiochus chose to obey the Roman ultimatum to avoid a new Roman Seleucid war, a retreat that Polybus, Polybius uh, described as personally humiliating for Antiochus. The day of Eleusis ended the Sixth Syrian War and Antiochus's hopes of conquering Egyptian territory. Still, the Ptolemies were greatly weakened by the war, as well as the conflict between the Ptolemy VI and VIII. Um, a rebel named Dionysus Petrosarapis would attempt to exploit the animosity between the two Ptolemy brothers and start a series of revolts. So we can say with certainty, this drawing this circle um, around... Um, um, Ptolemy the sixth is it Ptolemy the sixth is is something that is significant that we could put on the line as a Rome, right? So I, I don't know if we could call this the Sunday Law, but maybe it's a type of the Sunday Law. Does that make sense? That's where we're going to place that event. I don't know what to call it. Let's consider a little further today and then see what we can call it tomorrow. Yeah. I mean, I can just put, you know, 168 BC there. Right. You're, you're going to have the Battle of Pydna that just occurred. Um, so at least I can do that. So Rome comes into play there in a very strong. Okay. Any final comments before we close with prayer? No. Okay. Well, let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness and love and for the study today uh, to help us get through it <laughs> with our minds still intact. We know there's so much that we do not understand. 
And we need your help, your Holy Spirit guiding us. And uh, we need to have a clear understanding. Help us as we faithfully study your word for ourselves. We pray for all those who are looking into these things and may come across these videos on the Internet. We just pray that your Holy Spirit can lead and guide them. And we ask that you can continue to correct us in our personal lives, in not just the understanding of Scripture, but in our characters. Please be with us through the rest of the day and bring us together again to study your word according to thy will. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.